go loud. Welcome back to the Weekly Roast. How's it going, guys? How the hell are you? How are your hearts? And of course, how are your heads? Guys, what's going on? Listen, thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for tuning into the show. I hope you're doing all right. I really appreciate the support. Myself and my trusty, lovely life partner, Kieran, here beside me, are very grateful for your continued support over the last few months. If you're enjoying the podcast, please tell your friends. Send it to your mates if you have any. If you don't, no, it's not a problem. We can arrange that for you. Thanks for tuning in. What's going on, guys? Kieran, before we get into today's podcast, okay, which is all about the worst trends to ever hit Ireland, we do have to talk about a recent trend that is, well, not really a trend, but something that's happening in Dublin City at the moment, which is the Dublin portal to New York. Mm. What are your, are you a fan? It's very weird. Very weird. It's very strange. It is strange. It's a big FaceTime. It is a big, you know... I, I'm just going to put my... Do you want to hear my thoughts on it? No. Okay. Yes, please. <laughs> I'm going to give them to you anyway. I love the Dublin portal, okay, to New York City. I think it is... I think it has been the greatest exercise of anthropology in a, in a long time. The evolution of the portal in the space of, I mean, a couple of weeks has been pretty quick, like. In the first 48 hours, we saw a couple of arse cheeks and the occasional middle finger. Do you know what I mean? Pretty pretty standard stuff. Some people call it a good Saturday night. Brilliant. But like, all in all, it was just a bit of crack. It was very innocent. And then the trouble began. We saw groups of young fellas approaching the portal with the same level of respect they gave the junior cert, by the way, uh, inhaling drugs and making lewd gestures. One of my friends, by the way, one of my friends was walking there and there was these two young guys and they began by doing the sort of wanking hands with their with their fists at these like bemused and bewildered citizens of the Bronx who were staring at them with screwed up faces going like, what is this? They were doing the wanking hand. Then they were doing the other thing where you spread the fingers and they had their tongues out. Then one of them got down on his knees and started pretending to give the other one a blow job. <laughs> My mate was like, lads, I don't know. They then went straight for the jugular with jokes about 9-11, which is horrendous. And they were horrifying all of the daily commuters in New York as they tried to, you know, the, the problem is at the beginning, the Americans were very innocent. They were trying to instigate like TikTok iterations of river dance and, you know, other cringeworthy stuff like that. They expected a scene from an Irish wish and instead they got the wish version of Ireland, okay? From the erotic to the narcotics, we just reveal ourselves as a nation of the neurotic. And by the way, I'm not complaining. Let that be very clear. The Dublin portal, in my opinion, is the gift that keeps on giving. The only problem I have Right. The only problem I had with any of the sort of chat around the portal is that the BBC wrote something about it and they described O'Connell Street as, and I quote, the hustling and bustling centre of all activity in Dublin's fair city. The hustling and bustling centre of all activity in Dublin. The centre of all criminal activity, maybe. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? O'Connell Street is bustling in the same way that Chernobyl is tranquil. And Aleppo is rustic. <laughs> Calling O'Connell Street the hustling and bustling centre of the city is almost as big of a crime as the crime you'd see on O'Connell Street. Anyway, I love the portal. Genuinely, I, we have no choice but to stand the portal because last week in the podcast we were talking about social media and about how you give a man a mask and he'll show you how he really feels. Give an Irish man a portal on Talbot Street at 2am and he'll show you his arse, you know. I think it's refreshing. I think the whole thing is refreshing because, and here's why, it's an accurate reflection of who we are as a people portrayed to the wider world. And I mean that because before the invariable Irish Times journals come out with the what did we expect and this is why we can't have nice things, good luck. I think we should embrace the realness that it's showing. Ours is meant to be democratic and for everybody. Normally, in this era of Instagram and social media, with, a, with an installation like this, it'll be put up on like South William Street or Stevens Green, where it would remain under guarded watch and become like a sanitised, you know, touristy thing that people only engage with in order to score points on Instagram. 
sort of like visiting their grandparents or pretending to care about the whereabouts of Joseph Coney. Nevertheless, my opinion is that the Dublin portal is the greatest thing to happen to Irish culture since therapy became socially acceptable and we stopped calling men who use the odd bit of moisturiser as metrosexuals. Do you remember that? I was over in Craig Mooney's house on the weekend. Who? Craig Mooney. Cra- which one of the uh, Mooney's Craig again? It's not the one who wears aftershave, is it? Oh, it is, yeah. I believe he's metrosexual. Really, yeah? Yeah, well, he was last seen using a bit of libello in December when his lips were dry and he occasionally talks about his feelings. That'll be him, all right. Completely gay. <laughs> you can't say gay, granddad. You have to say metrosexual, but in a way that makes it clear you think it's derogatory. Anyway, okay, we're, we're nearly done, but here's lastly but not leastly my portal predictions, Kieran. You ready? Every marketing manager, brand person, and internet content rat is currently at home scurrying around their keyboard trying to figure out ideas of how they can capitalise on the Dublin portal and figure out how they can make it about them. Sort of like what I'm doing now. But here's the prediction, right? Somebody is going to get engaged in front of us, okay? That's going to happen. There'll be like a viral uh, video of something unfathomably sentimental where somebody will propose to his, you know, partner who lives in Manhattan and it'll be everywhere and it's all going to go crazy. Or even worse, worse again than all of those things. Keen De Crow is going to suddenly appear <laughs> with the guitar making one of those videos he does when he surprises people. You know those ones? Yeah. You know those... Now, look, fair play to Kean, by the way, and all of the success he's achieving, that has to be said. And fair play to each of the 17 rings he wears on his fingers. Because, let's be honest, I feel they play a pretty large role in his overall output. The man walks around with his hands covering his face like Martin Bleeding Cahill, otherwise known as the General, trying to disguise his identity going to the spa or something. Have you ever seen John? We get it, Kean. You like wearing rings. You've been down Claire's accessories and gotten yourself a few new adornments. I, too, am a fan of questionable jewellery. Do you know what? Keen de Crow looks like me, age 12, when I broke into my granny's upstairs cupboard in the middle of July and discovered her stash of Christmas crackers. And I remember trying, I remember trying to open them all silently without the thing going off which is the 12-year-old equivalent of dismantling an atomic bomb, by the way, then sneaking out of the cupboard with 15 plastic rings on my fingers and five sewing kits in my pockets. What are you doing in there, Mark? Sorry? You went up to Christmas crackers, were you? No, no, of course not, Nana. I sit down there for a second. I'm just going to speak to the nurse. Yeah, sorry, Doc. The old deer's hallucinating again, so I think we need to update the old dosage up. If you ever want to... I'm actually just going in to get a few groceries, mate. Do you mind if I just... I'm on the hunt for some cinnamon powder as I saw this recipe on YouTube. I'll wait for you every night. So, I'm actually... Sorry, I'm just here. I want to go in and collect my granny's ashes, please. Is that okay? You, you do realise you've positioned yourself outside O'Doyle's funeral home in Mulhudders, Kian, don't you? If you wait every night. What? Mate, why are you wearing that many rings as a matter of interest? Did you burgle 15 barn bracks in super value on the eve of Halloween? Have you sucked the fingers of every fellow in the smoking area of Grogan's? You know, have you been at the barn bracks, Kean? Kean, why are you pointing the camera as if I haven't noticed them, by the way? There's three people standing behind you. One of them's holding a boom mic. I saw it before I crossed the road at the lights. My son thought it was a fishing rod. The car park is otherwise empty. <laughs> How could I possibly be surprised? If you made a day... Why, why is it that Irish singer songwriters have to trail off whenever they speak? You know, if you ever want to live, it's not like it's love, mate, isn't it? Anyway, welcome back to the Weekly Rose. Alas, I hope you will bet on us. Now it's time for the worst trends to ever hit Ireland. Guys, there was an avalanche of DMs regarding things that, uh, the worst trends. Some things were just things that people hated. Uh, Other things were incredible trends that have uh, happened in Irish culture over the last 20 years. One thing that didn't get nominated, which I was really surprised by, uh, Kieran, was the neck nomination. Do you remember the neck nomination? The neck nomination was, I think, it, it, it was essentially a public IQ test. It, genuinely, because you could it really you could really gauge a man's intelligence by who he voted for. I mean, if he voted for his brother and his uncle, yeah, he stands a chance in life. Do you know what I mean? But then you got the I nominate George Celepa. 
Anna Kornikova and Cindy Crawford. Brilliant. What obscure... An obscure trio. But you know what I mean? I nominate Lucy Pinder. Brilliant. You've just revealed yourself as having the same prefrontal cortex as a Keish Lorraine. Ah, oh, cheers, Desi, for the nomination. I'll get you back for this, you bastard. Uh, anyway, the next nominations were won. A couple of other things that... Di- I'm just going to give you a real quick fire before we start of things that didn't get nominated that I thought should... Or not nominated, but uh, suggested that I thought should have as trends, okay? Here, I made a list. Paninis. Do you remember the paninis in like 2006? Sandwiches were gone and it was paninis everywhere. Uh, pulled pork. I thought pulled pork was omnipresent for around six or seven years. Bean bags, futons, juices. Uh, there was also a period in 2006 to around 2010 when it looked like the potato wedge was going to overtake the humble fry as the leading potato-based snack in Ireland. Thankfully, sanity prevailed. Also, phone ringtones that cost about nine quid from Jamster. Do you remember that? Mm-hmm. You buy one crazy frog and all of a sudden your parents have to sell the gaff because you get a bill for 73 grand next month. Um, okay, let's go. It's the Roast of Trends. I want to hear yours. Thank you for contributing to the show. At Megan Mark on Instagram. I love you all. I appreciate the support. Let's go. God bless. Hoxie Gendo reveals. I just don't get the buzz. You're going to have this big hooli probably out your back garden and it's a 50-50 chance and you're going to pop the balloon. You're having a boy, you're having a girl, whatever, grand. Yeah, everyone gets pissed and then... And what another month or two down the line, you have a baby shower, anyways. So, like, what's the big deal? Is it another excuse for a piss up? I think it's interesting with gender reveals. If you ever watch these videos, uh, just to focus on the face of the the husband or the man in the video, because he always has a look similar to any documentary I've ever watched on polyamory. Okay, which I don't care. I'm going to go out in the record. I don't believe in it. I. I don't believe in it. And I know that's probably opening me up to criticism. I don't care. I don't fucking believe in it. Anytime I've seen a documentary on polyamory, there's one person like, yeah, this is absolutely brilliant. We're loving it. I've got six uh, people to shag this evening. All going well. We all live together. We do finger painting and we shout at the moon in the evening and we believe in crystals. And then the other person's like, yeah, so... um she had sex with a guy yesterday and the day before. No, she seems pretty happy. Uh, I mean, one day maybe she'll see the benefit in just being in love with me it's like there is a look I just don't feel I don't feel like there's two people I don't know that's a different DM me if you think I'm completely wrong or from the stone age or a moron or what have you um, but please actually don't very sensitive at the end of the day but anyway there's the look on someone's face in a gender reveal party it's quiet tortured inner defeat do you know what I mean he lost the war a long time ago The bat- but the battles still continue and he's just looking at it. He's looking around this garden, okay, surrounded by bewildered pensioners and confused children and all these balloons. And he's wondering, what have I signed up for here? You know, whatever about the gender, that's irrelevant. Like, it's not about the child that concerns him. It's the fact that middle age is hurtling down the tracks faster than his teenage dreams can disappear. Two weeks ago, he was on Talbot Street showing his arse to a bunch of people from Brooklyn at 2am. <laughs> Let's go. How's things, Mark? Yeah, just on this one, I think it has to be American accents and Americanization of everything. You're from Lucan, and your whole family have always been from Lucan. Please stop. Okay, I'm completely with this, to a degree. I'll tell you why. First and foremost, the accent thing, I agree for a genera- for our generation, for instance, Kieran. Uh, I mean, I've made this point before on Instagram, and I'm going to make it again here. You know those people that like went to America for their J1 and they came back with accents? Guilty. There you go. Or you know those people that go to London for a couple of years and they come back with an accent. It doesn't seem to happen when they go to Thailand. <laughs> doesn't that? That's the fact. You don't get Saoirse coming back from Copan Yang. Go I'm not denying. No fucking way, mate. You do, no, you do it. <laughs> no way. But you don't though, don't you? Not? It's interesting that. The London thing is just like, yeah, so I mean, uh, I've just moved into Balham. Excuse me? Yeah, I've just moved into Balham with the girls. You're from Dean's Grange, Aoife. You've been there for less than a fortnight. You had 17 going away parties last month. The, the Irish couldn't have left you that quickly, okay? So... In that regard, yes, I completely agree with the Americanization. I also feel the sort of language, I just feel, which I've just said, oh God, he's becoming the person that he used to roast. <laughs> oh, we know that, Mark. You've been like that ever since you started becoming happy. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Anyway, um, the, I just feel, I just feel like for me, 
uh, where I'm at right now in my life, in my world, like I, I like my job. I've got a good career, but other people are reaching out to me on LinkedIn. It's like that sort of American style thing. But then lastly, I will defend children. And this is an interesting one, I think. Children who are growing up, like uh, whatever you call them, Jen, whatever now, like as in who are five and six, who are growing up with iPads and the internet and playing Fortnite and video games. Their world is essentially the world. It's not colloquial. It's not like the kids in their primary school. It's, and even if it is, you know, obviously Ireland's become much more multicultural and stuff. But I'm their access and their... The ubiquity of the internet um, means that they are just surrounded by other accents all the time in ways that we never were. So maybe that would explain some of the, the little freaks calling it the sidewalk in the refrigerator. Talky teeth. That has to be one. Half of them come back looking like um, the pedigree ad. Not the one with the dogs on it. Wait there. Do I know the ad for pedigree chum with the dogs on it? Hmm. <laughs> let me... Let me think if I... <laughs> okay, go on. Not the one with the dogs on it. And they smile and they have... It's for um, the dentist sticks for the dogs. That's what half of them come back looking like. Absolutely ridiculous. I actually don't know that ad, to be fair, but she sent a picture and it is hilarious. Um, I love dogs. And uh, I love turkey, by the way. Uh, I love turkey. We went to Kusadasi last year and it was beautiful. Um, I really want to go to Bodrum. Nevertheless, uh, the turkey teeth. I, I'm... I'm slow to insult people who want to do something to change their appearance because uh, we all know what it feels like to think that this thing will change you. You know, this thing will enhance your your standing in life if you, if you were to just fix this aspect of yourselves. But there is a line, and I feel like with some of these teeth, they are just cartoonishly bad. Like, why is it that they get them so... Like, they're so insanely mental. Like, is that... Would you think that's fair enough to say? Very fair. Like, some of them are ridiculous. Um, yeah, worst trends. I mean, it has to be dry robes. Like, why are they a hundred euro? Um, and why do you need one when you might maybe get into some sort of body of water once a year, if even? And then like people are like, you know, like in the car park, taking them out of the boot, like, you know, like some sort of like seasoned swimmer. And it's like, you're just throwing it on you like to go, you know to Malahide once a year and take a little dip. Like, just throw a towel on you. I I, I just can't see the point of them. Um, and then how they became also, like, an item of clothing. It's just so dire, like, see people bopping around in them. And I'm like, it's like you're out in your jammies. It's just, I don't know how they took off so much and why people got so on board with them. Kieran shaking his head. Do you agree? I just can. I, can I? Yep. <clears throat> oh. Thing on. K- wait, sorry. Excuse me, guys. This is history in the making. Kieran is jumping on the mic. We love to see it. <clears throat> can I just say that is a woman who is jealous because she can't pull off a dry robe. You wear a proud when you get out of the water. You saunter up and down the pier and you let people know you own a dry robe. Amy, how dare you? Oh, I feel like. Pulling off Kieran after that. What an what a shot of insulin to the soul of the podcast. Good God. I'm sweating. I've got a sweaty brow. Uh, anyway, <laughs> um, thank you for that, Amy, and thank you for that, Kieran. I do agree with Amy to the extent of there is an arrogance. There's an arrogance to the way that people wearing dry robes, they saunter to the car as if they're like returning from war or they've just scaled the uh, the Hillary step of Everest. Everest. Do you know what I mean? And um, the, the Hillary step uh, is the, Edmund Hillary is the first ever guy to climb Everest. And the Hillary step is that final curvature of, I just realised my brother, my future, my soon to be brother-in-law, John, has, he's the only Irishman to ever summit Everest. Oh. Isn't that mental? Right. Yeah. So, big shoes to fill. Anyway, back to the dry robes. Yeah, so I, I find like the way that they walk. And do you know the way, do you ever get when you're going for a swim and the, the person comes up walking with the dry robe and they've got like the smug grin on their face and they look at you and they're like, <laughs> it's beautiful down there. As if you asked. As if they're the, some, like they're the fucking sea sheriff. Do you know what I mean? I don't. I didn't ask for your opinion on the temperature of the water, by the way. The only thing that's lukewarm, by the way, is going to be my reception to your bad sea gags, Dad. No, I mean, anyone. Uh, <laughs> but it also, whenever they start calling it wild swimming, 
That's when they're completely off the deep end. Oh, I've gotten really into wild swimming. Really, yeah? The salt water has clearly crept up your nostrils, Connor, because you've lost your goddamn mind. Hope you're enjoying the roast of Irish trends, my friends. Now it's time to look at the textile things and matters of fashion. Let's go. Hi, Mark. Uh, so definitely Sambas are the worst trend to hit Ireland. Um, it's honestly a pandemic. I have a 30 minute commute to work and the last day I counted 17 pairs of Sambas on my 30 minute Lewis. It's just ridiculous. They're also so ugly. They look like clown shoes and look like you could be going bowling. And they're just disgusting. Like they're designed for girls with a size four foot. Anyone over a size four should not be wearing them. Looks like they're floating around in two boats. It's disgusting. Um, really what ruined it for me is a particular Irish blogger, I won't name names, um, dressed herself, her husband and both kids all in matching sambas in one picture. Just honestly disgusting. You know a trend has gone too far when Rishi Sunak is wearing them. Like they suit him. They're geek shoes, nerd shoes, like prime minister shoes. They are not shoes for like South Dublin girlies. <laughs> okay, first things first, let's just remember one thing. Now, maybe it's generational trauma from the potato famine, but there will always be an appetite for basic in Ireland. That's just the way it is. Look at how many followers Bleep Bleep has, for instance. Just look at how successful Bleep Bleep is. Also, another example. And now we also need to remember, it's not just the Sambas, okay? Because in essence, there is nothing wrong with an Adidas Samba by itself. It's the things that go with it. It's the Aperol spritz in the sun with the, and it feels like summer. Do you know what I mean? It's the Anina Bing t-shirt. It's the fresh Sunday's Instagram story of a food market on the weekend, even though we all know they didn't eat a thing because 9am is far too early for a vindaloo and frankly, far too early for a shish kebab. I just think also, as a nation, I, I've been thinking about this recently. I don't think that Ireland, Irish people, I don't think we're great at dressing for ourselves or shapes. We sort of blindly just wear what's trending without wondering if it works for us individually at all. Like, for instance, I remember a couple of years ago, Kieran, you might have been a fan of this trend. Guys were wearing wife beaters in public during the summer. You know, never. No. And the thing is, that's all well and good, by the way, if you've got a development contract with Leinster, you know. But if I wear a wife beater in public, I look like Onslow from Keeping Up Appearances. <laughs> who's been let out for the day. Do you know? <laughs> Genuinely. So, I'm with you on the Sambas. Let's go. Definitely for me, it had to be the time when all the men were wearing the beige chinos and the Rihanna t-shirt from Topshop. And they all had their hair cut into like a V mohawk, spiked at the top, but the fringe had to be like slicked down onto their face into like a side fringe it was the height of fashion if you ask me <laughs> <laughs> yeah look the Ramones t-shirt walked so the Rihanna t-shirt could run straight into the plips, plimsoll and cargo pan section of pennies before spiking the front of the fringe up and heading out for an evening outside the local chipper where the activities range from spitting and littering to loitering and fingering the amount of times I... <laughs> Kieran didn't like the fingering one. <laughs> the amount of times I've been started on by guys in that Rihanna t-shirt. I think they're called spicers, aren't they? Isn't there that spicer haircut they call where you basically gel down the front of the fringe and then you spike up the middle of your hair. Did I ever tell you about the worst haircut I've ever had? This is a tr true story, by the way. Go on. So I was in, uh, I went to St. Bridget's uh, National School in Cabin Teeley, right? Shout out St. Bridget's. Shout out Mr. O'Mara, by the way. Lovely principal from Kerry. Um, nevertheless, I went to St. Bridget's and the trend that swept my school, but I think I was only one of the few to actually follow through with it, was I got a Nike tick shaved into the back of my head. Oh, no. Yeah, let's go. Yeah. That was, by the way, a year later, I'm in St. Michael's and I've got the wheelie bag. <laughs> like, <laughs> How times can change. My dad coming into me with the carving knife in the middle of the night trying to get me back to what I used to be. So the one that gives me the absolute ick is those guys that go around with those like ankle grazer chinos or jeans with ankle socks and a little pair of runners or with those loafers that look like they're not wearing any socks with their ankles coming out. I Like I literally 
cannot cope with it. it. Gives me the ick every time I see it. And they're usually wearing like a polo shirt that's bait onto them, tucked into the pants, flexing their arm muscles and they've no leg muscles to match. Oh, and they've usually had a sunbed and or a spray tan. They've got their eyebrows waxed and dyed um, and probably their hair too. Cannot be dealing with it. I absolutely love this because it's the niche thing of it's it's the little hint of the ankle sock that people find so disturbing. Do you know what I mean? Because it's just like a suggestion of a sock. It's this little, it's so much thought has gone into it. It's so fucking human. Do you know what I mean? Which makes, it's just like the charade or the veneer of you being a cool person is gone because this little, you know, your mum probably bought the socks for you and they're just sneaking above. The, you'd be better off going bareback. You'd be better off sticking the dogs straight in, raw dogging a pair of brown base London loafers, you know, seeing those guys at the races in the summer with the scent emanating from the sweaty toes that could sedate a medium sized boar. But yeah, these guys with the sort of skin tight tops and the, the short trousers with the, the skin tight, is it like, what do they call them? Jeggings or something? You know, st- glue painted on, that's the word, like painted on trousers with uh, the ankles on show. You know, you've just described every one of Wayne Lineker's followers on Instagram. Uh, he seems like a, a charming enough chap. <laughs> you know, you've just described every person that has ever used the term cheeky Nando's. You've just described every man who has ever sent a wildly inappropriate message to a girl 12 years his junior on Instagram, followed up by the cheeky handy monkey emoji. You know that one with the monkey's hands covering the face. You've just sent a Richard Pick, my friend. It's Dick Pick. So let's go. Hi, Mark. The worst trends to hit Ireland was definitely the no socks and chinos on country lads. So the chinos are like two sizes too small to show off their ties, maybe. I don't know, because they play county. Let's go. And then the pasty white ankles. And even worse, if they're wearing those ankle socks. Oh my God. No, no, no. And like the loafers, the brown loafers, the black loafers with the cream chinos. Loafers, all clearly bought for 20 euro on ASOS, just looks terrible. Yeah, okay, uh, forget the the ASOS thing. What I will say about this is, and I remember making this joke in the first ever episode of the original podcast, there was a period in Ireland, like 10 years ago, when if an Irish man didn't wear socks with, his, with shoes one time, he'd get given a show on expose, and, and he'd be considered like the fashionista, do you know what I mean? I'm not going to name any names. We'll call him X Kenny. No, I'm joking. We'll call him Rob X. Uh, the, the chinos, skin tight chinos. I think what we're getting at here is ultimately, guys, the bare foot with loafers is just, especially because also you can hear the sort of squeaking. <laughs> thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyable episode of the podcast. I hope you are having fun with it too. Having fun with it is strange. It makes it sound like you're listening to Joni Mitchell and sobbing into your pillow whilst going at yourself with a Love Actually DVD. Nevertheless, um, speaking of going at yourself, this next one is very confusing. It's not Willy Willy Bum Bum section for those of you of the faint of heart. Uh, it's just a confusing one. I am i don't know what era of Irish culture this is from, but I'd like you to listen to it and let me know if you remember this because I do, I do not. Let's go. How are you getting on, Mark? Um, how's the head? Love, Love the podcast. Um, yeah, so my worst trend is the incumbent of the delicious, pro- obviously you can't see, but the pictures I sent, the sex bracelets. Those bracelets that you wore and a colour, if you broke it, you had to do the action and the colour uh, coordinated with the action. And as you can see there in the list, this is yellow hugging, purple kissing, you know, a bit, a bit weird. Slightly innocent, and you get onto red lap dance, blue oral sex. Why? How is this a game? How is this expected to be carried out? Who is the pervert that created this game? Who is now on the circumference of the school limits, looking in with the binoculars, fucking rubbing his Levi jeans? <laughs> oh fuck, that's good. That's interesting. Uh, okay, so somebody else wrote into me saying they were called loom bands. They were popular because you could make them at home, uh, which. 
it wasn't it didn't happen in my school for whatever reason. We had a trend though of shrinking crisp packets. Yeah. Onto key rings. Yeah, let's go. Yes. Banshee Bones, Monster Munch, Meanies, Burger, but just naming crisps now, really. <laughs> this is the crisp podcast. Um yeah, so you'd oh you'd put the crisp packet in the oven, I think, and just let it shrink and then it would harden up and that would be Hello. Shrink and harden, that's counterintuitive. It happens, by the way. It can happen. Do it's a crisp packet. Yeah, do a crisp packet. Okay, let's go. Honest to God, that Muller situation just needs to be culled. Like, you know, the way they do like a culling of the deer in the Phoenix Park when there's too many. I think they should just let um, barbers and hairdressers roam free and... Firstly, they do let barbers and hairdressers roam free. It's called the Grafton Lounge. I believe it's open Fridays and Saturday nights. I'm free and get rid of all those mullets. I have a 10 and 11 year old boys here and if they ever come home with mullets, I will take the risk of them needing therapy for life and shave their heads in the middle of the night. Like, it just gives me the ick. Do they realise it looks stupid? Like, are they unaware? So I'm, I'm genuinely an enormous fan of that voice note because I also wholeheartedly agree with the opinion. I was walking down Dublin's Drury Street last week. Okay, you know Drury Street? Yeah. For those unfamiliar or for those from further afield, Drury Street has become the sort of mecca for Dublin's hipster scene. Uh, a scene that I am not a part of, okay? Thus, I have to point fingers and, you know, Nevertheless, I was walking down and there was two guys in front of me and they were having a very loud, almost to the extent I felt like they wanted people around them to hear. You know, you know, one of those people when they're having a so they're having a conversation that's not really that subtle, like, you know. And they were complaining about the lineup for Electric Picnic. And they were giving out about how that there are no well known acts booked for Electric Picnic this year according to these two guys. Both of them had mullets and both of them had moustaches, okay? And they were trendy, shall we say. I was like waiting to jump. I actually almost wanted to jump in and go, are you fucking joking me? Calvin Harris, Kylie Minogue, like, like objectively, you cannot say that these people aren't well known. He was giving a like, Calvin Harris, man, is just not big enough to be headlining Electric Picnic. So Calvin Harris is the world's highest paid DJ, funnily enough, okay? Calvin Harris is the first solo UK artist to reach a billion streams. That's more than Adele. Think about that. First UK artist to have 10 top 10 singles from a single album. Like Calvin Harris is, and by the way, don't come, like Calvin Harris is a goat. He can do whatever he wants. He can release an album and throw in an acid house song in the middle of, a, of an album that is literally back to back with top five hits. He is, he is on a different, pla- like a different ether to most, on a different plane to most pro- music producers. These gobshites, and yeah, no, he's a complete, like, he's he's not main stage, uh, or he's not head of Electric Picnic stuff, sending from Rathgar, you know, who, who'd much prefer to see the Wolf Tones do an acoustic set because he's just spent three weeks learning the lyrics to come out ye black and tans and even has them written down in the notes section of his iPhone. Do you know what I mean? Sennin, who until 2020 thought that Fairview was the name of a British television soap. Okay, you know the type of guy this guy is. Sennin, who, when recently asked by his English girlfriend, where's the best place in Dublin to get a Brazilian, Sennin replied, uh, Dicey's on a Tuesday. Do you, know, do you know what I mean? He still is the personality of a secondary school sports jock, but because he now dresses like a Victorian chimney sweep and hangs out with other mullet and moustache-wearing wankers, he's decided that he's a tastemaker. Oh, Calvin Harris is such a letdown, man. I wish they started booking real acts, you know? Acts for the people. I'm sorry that Sinn Féin aren't doing a DJ set, Senan. I'm sorry that Mary Lou MacDonald isn't going back to back with Jeremy Corbyn performing an eight-hour tribute show to the Che Guevara. Hipster hatred is not a novel concept, but sometimes we need to lean into it. So yes, shave off the mullets. You look like gobshites. And I say that with somebody who's never had a questionable haircut. (laughs) Hi, Mark. I think the gin and tonic trend was one of the worst to hit Ireland. People who would have previously taken their drink through a dirty sock, if that's all that was available, suddenly found it unacceptable to have their gin and tonic unless it was served in a fishbowl sized glass. And it was no longer okay to simply order a gin and tonic. You needed to know what brand of gin you liked, what brand of tonic you were going to take. 
and expected to have everything from slices of orange to peppercorns on offer in order to complement your gin. Absolute notions. I completely agree. It did. Gin and tonics really reached complete hysteria, didn't they? Unless you have a tree now, half a tree, a branch of rosemary, 55 juniper berries, a twig, uh, six bit of black pepper. You don't also, you don't like the black pepper. You don't like, you like saying, can I get black pepper and that? Because it makes you feel like a sophisticated person. It makes you feel like a French individual. Avec le perspicace et le chaud comme ça. No, terrible accent. But like, do you know what I mean? It's the, I remember sitting in a bar one time. Just the once, was it? <laughs> I see what you're saying, Kieran. You're looking at me and you're laughing. You're saying, how many have you had today? If you're counting. No, um, but I remember sitting in a bar one time in Dublin a couple of years ago, a few, a couple of years ago, and this girl was like, excuse me, do you have Hendrix? And the guy was like, no. And she goes, okay, I'll get something else. He's like, oh, I've got all these other gins. He's like, no, I only drink Hendrix. I only drink Hendrix. That is just, I nearly fell off my seat. Why is that, says you. <laughs> On we go. Girls put stick in their hair to their head. Well, that was the quickest voice note recorded in the history of audio. But uh, girls uh, sticking prit stick to their head. Or what was it? Girls put stick in their hair to their head. Girls put stick in their hair to their head. Is that a thing? Is that a trend? I mean, I remember one time when we were kids, we were over to Made of Mine's Gap and he was slagging his brother for not having any pubes. <laughs> and his brother cut off hair from the back of his head and came in and he had print sticked them downstairs. <laughs> he was 34 at the time, worked in extra vision. If you're listening, Keith, hope the old connects is still going well, my man. <laughs> I don't even know what that is. Uh, but yeah, I've never heard of that print stick in the old can. Guys, thank you so much for listening to the Weekly Roast. It is a pleasure. It's a pleasure every week. Uh, if you're enjoying the show, please let me know at Megan Mark on Instagram. And if you have any suggestions or requests or things you'd be interested in hearing more of in the podcast, uh, send me a DM uh, at Megan Mark on Instagram. And let me know whatever you'd like us to roast next. I'm thinking we should do a special on hens, stag and stag do's. Oh, sorry. Also, actually, I need to plan a sober stag. So uh, if anybody has any advice or feedback on what I should do, please let me know. Because by the way, I don't want to go paintballing. I'm not the paintballing type. Like I only would have done that if I was able to go and get hammered afterwards. So like any suggestions, I would really appreciate your your thoughts. And again, just genuinely, thank you so much for listening to the show. Uh, it's such a lovely break and a bit of light bit of escapism. And I hope you enjoy it too. Um, mind yourselves. Speak to you next week. All the best. 